the Kodik Fellowship Program. He has more than uh, 100 uh, publications to his credits. He's written book chapters for uh, Nelson's uh, Pediatric Orthopedic, Lowell and Winter's uh, Pediatric Orthopedics, and, uh, and recently a chapter for uh, Green's uh, Surgery Textbook. He's also published a book uh, on pediatric hand drama for American Society of uh, Surgery of Hand. His special interest is uh, birth breakup lectures, palsy, pediatric trauma, and uh, congenital differences. So considering today's uh, audience, we have chosen the trauma, trauma as a topic of discussion. Uh, we are honored to have you, Professor. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, please uh, share your screen and proceed with your first talk on Montage Fractures. Excellent. Thank you very much for that uh, that kind introduction of, of all of those things that you talked about. Well, first of all, Roger Federer is way out of my league. <laughs> when uh, when I talk to colleagues about you know about leadership or about practice management or research or whatnot, and they're having trouble, I suggest that they get a coach. And and in, in America, I'm not sure if it's the case in India, but in America, having a coach as professional is like you, you need remedial help. But, but I always use the re reminder that Roger Federer has a coach, right? So the greatest tennis player of all time still has a coach. So you can be the best in the world and still need a coach. So I had a coach for a little while. So that's another thing I have in common with Roger Federer. But other than that, there's no comparison whatsoever. He's a much better looking, much nicer guy. So and, and much more talented at his, at his craft than I will ever be. Um, I, I would never pretend to be the world number one, but he, he doesn't have to pretend. So um, thank you for the, the warm and, but I was gonna say uh, of all of the things that you mentioned, uh, the one thing that, I, that I'm perhaps most proud of is the heavy metal. Um, I actually just released a death metal album last year. So oh, that's um, you'll never find it Googling me because, uh, because it's under a completely different name, but I'll just throw that out there. So if, the, if there are any other metal heads in the audience, rock on. All right, so let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, I'll share my screen here. Um, and I and I feel a little bit. Uh, um, we're starting with Montagia practice, correct? Okay, great. Um, uh, so I, I'm I'm a little I have a little trepidation with Montagia practice here because I, I know that the work done in India is is really phenomenal. I've had a long history uh, collaborating with folks there, especially in the brachial plexus world and and orthopedic surgeons, but also plastic surgeons as well who do a lot of the brachial plexus work and. And I was able to visit Chennai a couple of years ago, and I was very, very impressed with the level of uh, sophistication of the work um, and research being done. So, um, so some of this will be extraordinarily basic, um, but but I'll I'll share some of my opinions along the way, and and really I'd like to try to focus on some of the complications of these problems because that's a, I believe something we don't talk about uh, really a, as often, and so. Um, so having the, the title master class on here really is because we have a master class of people uh, attending this call, not not because I belong to such a, a master class. So let's start uh, first talking about Montagia fractures. First off, I have no relevant disclosures related to this topic, but I do actually want to call attention to uh, a book that you mentioned earlier on pediatric hand trauma. It's actually the first ever textbook devoted specifically to pediatric hand injuries which is unusual since these are that's the most commonly injured part of the child's body. And so, uh, so the Hand Society, the American Society for Surgery of the Hand commissioned this book, and, and I'm really uh, particularly excited about it. Uh, it has a, a, lot of, a lot of contributors actually from around the world who have, who have added their expertise. And it, it can be a really good resource for emergency departments, uh, generalists, specialists, all the way up to specialized pediatric hand surgeons. I get no money from this book whatsoever, so I can shamelessly promote it without any concern of a conflict of interest. But, uh, but do check it out uh, on the Hand Society website. Um, so the outline of, of this talk uh, on Montagia fractures, we'll first start with the injury and then evaluation of it, and then we'll focus on treatment of acute injuries and treatment of chronic injuries, ending with a few cases to illustrate a couple of the points along the way. So the injury, as we all know, is an ulna fracture with an associated radial head dislocation, although there are variations of it, such as ulna plastic deformation, so there isn't actually a fracture, but just the bowing of the ulna, or an olecranon fracture. That can happen, uh, yeah, that can happen as well, and so it's not always an ulnar shaft fracture. 
And then there are versions that have a radial head subluxation rather than a complete dislocation, and that can be somewhat tricky to sort out sometimes. Uh, they're classically uh, classified as anterior, uh, posterior, lateral uh, dislocations, you know, one, two, and three, and then uh, Vado type four is anything that includes a radius fracture. And I have to give credit to my friend and colleague, Dan Slotolo at Philadelphia Shriners Hospital, who drew these pictures. He's really quite a, quite a good artist. Um, when we when we talk about the the injury and, and its treatments, I think we need to keep in mind all of the various problems that are associated with this injury, and I think that's a it's a good way to think about it. First of all, there's an impact on the elbow and forearm motion, so pronation and supination, but also the stability, and this is uh, both an impact from the injury and from the treatment, and we'll, we'll give you some examples of that uh, as we move forward. And also, it's important that you need an anatomic reduction of the radial head. So we rely tremendously, as you know, on remodeling of fractures in children. So we don't have to get it perfect, but dislocations don't remodel. And I bring that up specifically because I, I will from time to time hear people think, oh, I just thought that would remodel. Well, yeah, the dislocation doesn't remodel. And unfortunately, it's something that's easily missed, often because there's a relatively unimpressive injury, also because there's, uh, there's a lack of ossification of the articular surfaces that can, in some cases, make it difficult to sort out the alignment. And then the ulna is usually not grossly displaced. Sometimes it can be, but it can be actually very subtle, so it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't spark a lot of concern. So when you evaluate these children, it's, it's really important to pay attention to the details. So the mechanism of injury is important, but also the timing of the injury. And, and it can be that there's a minor injury that brings attention to deformity from a prior injury. So it's, it's actually important to ask about a remote history of any injuries in the past, because it could be a re-aggravation of a chronic montage when you finally see it. On the physical exam, swelling, tenderness, and, and bruising can certainly be present, but it also can be pretty subtle, as well as the forearm deformity. Sometimes just looking at the forearm, it just looks a little bit concave on the other side of the forearm, but otherwise it, there isn't much deformity. The radial head can be prominent, although that's usually only the case if it's lateral or posterior lateral dislocation. Forearm rotation can actually be surprisingly good, especially with an anterior dislocation. And then always examine the neurovascular status, as with any trauma, because a uh, posterior interosseous nerve palsy can coexist with a lateral dislocation. And then radiographs, of course, are, are critical. And I, I strongly suggest full-length forearm films, because if you just look at, a, at an elbow view here, you would miss the ulna deformity. You might see a little bit of a hint of it here. But if you get a full-length forearm film, you can clearly see the anterior bow to the ulna. So the, the posterior cortex of the ulna should be at or below a line drawn from the posterior surface of the lecranon to the ulnar styloid. Uh, and so any anterior bowing suggests that there's a, that's a deformity. And of course, this is associated with the radial head dislocation. That's something Scott Mabarak showed us a few decades ago. And then of course, the radiocapitellar line, we focus on that quite a bit. So uh, a line drawn along the proximal radius should pass through the capitellum. However, we've actually done a couple of studies investigating the relationship of the radiocapitellar line in normal elbows finding that, they, that the, the drawing of the radiocapitellar line is very subjective, even in normal elbows, and it can pass through, or it can miss the capitellum in up to a third of, of normal elbows, and it depends on the type of view that you have and how you draw the line. And so what we've concluded, that, that in large part has to do with the eccentric ossification of the capitellum uh, when you compare radiographs and MRIs. And so when you have subtle malalignments of the radiocapitellar joint, a radiocapitellar line is not necessarily uh, a good way to sort that out. So it, it can be misleading. And so in some circumstances, advanced imaging is required. So an MRI is great because it can show you both the radial head alignments of the capitellum and the deformity of the radial head. The trouble is that it can require anesthesia or sedation in young children, where, uh, in children of the age where you tend to get montagia fractures. Ultrasound can be done instead. It's dynamic and you don't require sedation. You can do it in real time. And it can give you some assessment of the gross radiocapitellar alignment. It doesn't really show you the, radi the radial head shape, uh, but it can tell you if it is aligned normally or not in certain planes. An orthogram can also be very good. Uh, it, we tend to do those in the operating room under anesthesia, but what it, it, what it means is that it, you're in an operating room under anesthesia. And so if you indeed see radiocapitellar malalignment, you can treat it at that point and you can use it intraoperatively to, to, to assess the quality of your reduction. And so if, 
so my uh, so my preference between an orthogram is if I'm almost certain I'm going to operate, I'll do an orthogram and then operate. I'm almost certain I'm not going to operate, I'll do an MRI to confirm that. So that's uh, that's just a, a general uh, principle there. It's important to keep in mind the differential diagnosis of a Montage lesion, and, and certainly the most common one that, that we think about is a congenital radial head dislocation. You've got a chronic looking injury. You don't know, is this a, a missed Montage from a prior trauma or is this a congenital dislocation? So some things that can help differentiate that, first of all, in a congenital dislocation, there's no or, or minimal trauma. Sometimes it's just that I bumped my elbow on the wall and got an x-ray and look, it's dislocated. Um, it is sometimes by is often bilateral, even if there's asymmetry in the deformity, sometimes it's just a little bit of a slant to the radial head or to the, to the radial neck on one side, which would indicate uh, a radiocapitellar uh, malformation. And then there's there's associated radial head and capitellum deformity. Sometimes it's just hypoplasia of the capitellum, which you don't tend to see in a, a, a missed montagia. And it tends to be more commonly posterior, whereas a missed uh, or a chronic montagia lesion is more commonly anterior. And then, of course, if you have concerns about the, the elbow relationship, you have to think about an elbow dislocation, which is really pretty uncommon versus a transpiceal fracture, which occurs in much younger children. Um, and so the important thing here is not just to look at the radial capitella relationship, but also the humeral, the ulnohumeral relationship as well. So treatment of acute injuries typically uh, starts with closed reduction and casting, which is quite often successful. Um, if you're concerned about the radio capitellar alignment, such as in this case where you have an ulna, an olecranon fracture and a, or a very, very proximal ulna fracture and a completely unossified radial head, then an orthogram can be used to confirm this. But these can be dislocated, so I do like to follow them in a cast to make sure they don't. Um, if, uh, if plain closed reduction alone is not successful, then intraventrally fixation can be used uh, to, to ensure stability. And this is actually... Uh, most commonly used in my hands when you have a plastic deformation. And in that circumstance, I'll use a rigid Steinman pin as big as I can possibly fit through the, the canal of the ulna to both achieve and maintain the reduction. If you use a flexible nail like a, uh, like a Nancy nail, it's, not going, it's just going to follow the curve of the ulna. It's not going to straighten it out. But a rigid Steinman pin from the electron tip can certainly do that. And that's the only time I'll ever put a pin through the tip of the electron. Um, because it can cause a lot of skin irritation. But that's one way that you can get the get and maintain the reduction of a plastic deformation. Um, sometimes you need to open reduce the radial capitellar joint, either because the anterior ligament is flipped around the radial head or because the radial head is buttonholed through the capsule. And sometimes you need an open reduction and internal fixation for the ulna, either because there's an, an un unstable fracture that needs to be plated or because you need a tension band or, or even pins for these uh, long oblique electron fractures. Um, and sometimes even because you need to do an acute osteotomy, if your plastic deformation cannot be reduced well enough, you need to do an acute osteotomy just to restore the normal radiocapitella relationship by bending the ulna to compensate for the plastic deformation. And so that can be, that can be necessary sometimes. Uh, moving into the chronic montages, I think the, the indications are important to, to keep in mind. If there is pain, obviously, if there's a deformity, and especially if there's a restriction of motion, then there, then there are indications for treatment of chronic ones. Uh, but what is a little bit unclear is whether or not a treatment of a chronic montage lesion will prevent forearm uh, and elbow instability or arthrosis. There aren't good data. Perhaps you have, you have a better experience there, but in, in, our, uh, in our circumstances here, there aren't good data on, uh, on, old, on elbow problems in the setting of missed montages or chronic let's say anterior radial head dislocations where you lose the lateral stability of the elbow. And now uh, the trouble is we just don't have a denominator. We don't know who is out there not having problems. And so it's really hard to sort that out. But I think if, uh, if there is an opportunity without too much difficulty to restore the normal anatomy of the elbow, then I think it, it certainly should be considered as an indication. The, the question that comes up is what about the timing? So uh, there are data suggesting that less than three years from the injury, the results are better, it's more achievable. But what I think is important is whether or not the radial head is still concave. If you still have some concavity to the radial head, you can get it to articulate with a capitellum and get some inherent stability. If the radial head is now purely convex, I don't think you'll be able to achieve enough stability there without restricting forearm motion and, uh, and the, the reduction is not going to be worthwhile. And so the principles really are to achieve a radiocapitellar reduction, maintain radiocapitellar stability, both of which are best accomplished through an ulna osteotomy, 
And this is a series of, of cases where an ulnar ostomy, osteotomy was not achieved and over half of them re-dislocated. It was not performed and over half of them re-dislocated. And then the, the algorithm was switched to include an ulnar osteotomy and none of them re-dislocated after that. There was a, a longitudinal series that was, that was very, very helpful uh, from 2002. But also we want to preserve motion. So in the setting of a, a chronic Montagia lesion, there's actually usually really good motion. And so you don't want to take that motion away in an attempt to make the x-ray look better. And so really the technique has several steps. First, I like to expose the radiocapitellar joint. In a chronic lesion, there's often stuff in there, pulvinar if you want to call it that, or there's an annular ligament that's flipped around. So you need to make way for the radiocapitellar joint to reduce. Then I'll expose in a separate incision uh, the ulna and perform an osteotomy using, you're using uh, an intact hinge. And that's usually because I don't tend to feel like you need to sh you know, lengthen it very often. And, uh, and that hinge and the osteotomy will be in whatever direction you need to do to get the ulna uh, to, to point the radial head towards the capitellum. And then ignore the ulna osteotomy. Once you've made the cut, go back and reduce the radiocapitellar joint. And what that will do is move the ulna into whatever position it needs to be in to keep the radiocapitellar joint aligned. And then you just plate the ulna wherever, wherever it lies at that point. And so use the radiocapitellar alignment to tell you where the ulna needs to go. And then I'll repair the soft tissues around or the capsule or annular ligament and then assess the stability. And then if it's not stable through a full range of motion, I'll revise the ulna position. Only as a, uh, only if that does not do it or you can't move the ulna any further, then I will consider pinning the radiocapitellar joint using as big a pin as I can safely put in there so it doesn't break inside the joint. And only as a very, very last resort will I reconstruct the annular ligament. And the reason for that is that the annular ligament reconstructions, if you look at every table in every series of annular ligament reconstructions ever published, every single subject, every single patient loses pronation when you reconstruct the annular ligament. I'll show you an example of that. And so in today's day and age with computer dominance, I don't think there's, there's really any reason to, to knowingly take away someone's pronation, even in their non-dominant hand. And so here are a couple of cases to, to uh, illustrate a couple of these points. So here's a six-year-old boy who had this injury and it's a plastic deformation of the ulna. He was casted, this was missed. And so he comes in four weeks later in this circumstance. And so he undergoes an ulna, ulna osteotomy and an open radiocapitellar reduction without any pinning, without any uh, annular ligament reconstruction. And he goes on to heal it quite well. Here's a 10-year-old girl who had an injury two years earlier. So now we're sort of pushing the timing there and she's a little bit older and MRI confirmed that there is indeed concavity to the radial head. So it's worthwhile undergoing a reduction. And so here's a here's a, uh, an ulna osteotomy and open radiocapitella reduction. You'll see there's an apex lateral bend to the, to the osteotomy because there's an anteromedial dislocation, but there was a limit to how far I could, how, how far I could bend the ulna uh, with an apex lateral bend because then it started to impinge on the radius. And so the radial radiocapitellar joint was okay, but sure enough, a week later, it started to re-dislocate. So I took her back to the OR and I couldn't revise the ulna any further, as I mentioned. So I put a radiocapitellar pin in, but you'll notice how big that pin is, and how it comes out the radial neck just in case it breaks because you don't want something like that to happen where now you've got a broken pin inside the joint. And so one year later, she's maintained stability. The, the pin was left in for six weeks and then with a cast and then, and then everything was removed. Um, and uh, and the, the plate was removed ultimately uh, after about a year. And so you can see that she has full range of motion in her elbow. In fact, she has completely full pronation, which is important. And so compare that to a five-year-old here who has this acute injury, who is again casted and the ulna is healing, but this is here. And you'll see this often, this is an ossification of the annular ligament. And that's something that you'll often see draped over the, the cartilaginous radial head. It also sort of gives you an ossifagram, if you will, uh, of the radial head. So here's an osteotomy. This is done by a friend of mine uh, where the ulna is straight. It's not overcorrected. And so it, it's actually uh, not surprising that the radial head is still re-dislocated one week later after an annual ligament repair. And so there's a radial uh, capitellar pin. But this, in this circumstance, a radial, uh, an annual ligament reconstruction was done. And it stayed, and here you are two years later, but you've not only got this deformity of the radial neck from the annular ligament reconstruction, but no pronation at all. 
And so this is, in, in my opinion, not a good result because now you've taken away a, a pretty important range of motion. And that, I believe, is due uh, uh, predominantly to the radio capitular or to the annular ligament reconstruction. And so my preference is to only reconstruct the annular ligament as a last resort because of the loss of pronation to address the ulnar deformity well, well enough to obtain and mission and then using a, a, a radio capitular pin if you need to, using a big pin and leaving it proud on the radial neck. Now, sometimes ulnar lengthening is required in the more the long-standing ones. You can use either use an external fixator to distract it or use an acute lengthening with a step cut osteotomy or an oblique osteotomy, and those have both been described. Or you can use 3D planning with a, a, a company called Materialize that will use bilateral CT scans and, and pre-plan osteotomies and 3D print cutting jigs that you can see here, um, which can identify rotational deformities of the bones as well as a deformity in the radius that is often underappreciated. The trouble is it doesn't consider the soft tissues and the altered soft tissue tension and anatomy. And so really if the goal is to reduce the radiocapitular joint anatomically, which is essentially a soft tissue procedure, my, my prefer preference is to get the bone lined up in a way that will achieve that for you, even if it means a non-anatomic uh, position of the ulna, rather than doing much more um, elaborate osteotomies of both of them that may or may not correct the 3D, uh, the, the soft tissue problem. So in summary, I would say, obviously, be on the lookout for this injury acutely. It is something that, that can be missed. Use the ulna to obtain and maintain the radiocapitular reduction and, and try to get it right the first time because the revisions become certainly much more difficult and a treatment of a chronic lesion can certainly be harder than a treatment of an acute injury. So thank you very much. Thank you for the, for the talk, Professor. Dr. Jayant and Dr. Manohar, how to ask anything? So can we, I have one case, if I can present my Montagia case, and Thank then you. that will probably give us some room for discussion. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah there, are actually a couple of, there are a couple of questions in the chat there. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. That I'd be happy to, to tackle. So the, the PIN policy, um, it's uncommon. I don't know exactly what the numbers are. I haven't looked at the literature recently. Um, but part of that is because it typically only happens in a lateral dislocation, which is itself uncommon. Um, but the resolution rate is, is as close to 100% as you can get. Um, so it's almost always neuropraxia. These are not grossly, you know, widely displaced, like let's say a type three or four supracondylar humerus fracture. And so, and there, you don't have a sharp bone hitting it. So I think you, you have a, a much higher likelihood of, of uh, spontaneous resolution. So I, I've never had to explore one of those. And as far as the loss of pronation goes, I think the, the, uh, the anatomy of the proximal radial ulnar joint in pronation is very, very tightly constrained. So if you alter that anatomy or the kinematics of the proximal radial ulnar joint in any way, the most sensitive motion is going to be pronation. And I, there, there has to be some, uh, some lateral translation. It's a little bit like a combination of gliding and rotation at, at the knee. Um, and there's, there's gliding at the proximal, at the radiocapitular joint that occurs during pronation. And you can take that away by over tightening a, a, um, uh, a radiocapitular or an annular ligament uh, at the radiocapitular joint. But I, I don't know the exact kinematics of that. I'm sure that could be sorted out using um, uh, 3D CT scans or 4D CT scans in, in real time, but um, but it, it's very, very clear in the literature in my experience as well. Professor, so I have a question for the neglected uh, Montagia fractures. Where do you plan the osteotomy? Do you go proximal third, mid shaft, or the site of the original fracture? Yeah, so that's a great question. I typically go in the junction of the proximal and middle third. So the, because usually very often when they're missed, it's because there's a plastic deformation of the ulna or a very subtle green stick of the mid shaft ulna. And if you do a mid shaft osteotomy, I think you're running into a little bit more trouble with healing. It's harder to bury the plate. It's a, it's a little bit easier to heal quickly because you're, if you, if you use an, uh, an intact hinge, like I, I like to do just to increase stability and, and perhaps kickstart the healing, you're doing an opening wedge osteotomy. And when you do an opening wedge, you leave a gap. And I, I don't bone graft these. And so the closer to the metaphysis you are, the faster those will heal without using a bone graft. Um, and so, you know, but if you go too far proximally, then you have to correct, you have to create a huge osteotomy, a huge bend to compensate for the much more distal 
uh, bend in the shaft. So I like to kind of split the difference and go middle distal third, I'm sorry, uh, middle proximal third junction. And, and there you put the plate around on the lateral side, typically, where you can bury it quite nicely. How about the fracture? The fracture is fresh and you, know, you can see the fracture line. Is it still okay to go through the fracture? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so, so if you think you've got a chance of, of getting a better reduction of the fracture, well, that's the best because then you're, then you're restoring normal anatomy. You're not creating a second deformity to, co to compensate for a, a first deformity. One more thing, sometimes you see the, uh, in addition to the montage of fracture dislocation, you also see a radial bowing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see it uh, very common? And uh, if you see the bowing, do you do something with it? Yeah, so that's where the debate comes in. I, I have colleagues who like to use the materialized and they'll say, that, you know, you've, you've really got to do that because you're missing all of these radial deformities and it's going to be a problem. And, uh, but I, honestly, I, I haven't, I, I've seen the radial bowing. I, I've seen that be an issue but if you if you back up to the non-montagia plastic deformations of the forearm so you have a radial bow a worse radial bow unless it's very extended so an apex volar bow of the radius that restricts pronation and um, the the radial bow itself doesn't tend to be as much of a problem as the ulnar bow is and so if you correct the ulnar bow you get good stability of the radius the one circumstance where i will correct the radial bow is, as I mentioned, if there's an extension deformity, so in neutral forearm rotation, if the radius is extended, then as you pronate that, uh, that uh, the apex of the radius will impinge on the ulna and either stop the forearm from pronating or kick the radius out, the radial head out anteriorly. And so in those circumstances, I'll do a flexion osteotomy of the radius at the same time as correcting the ulna. I've had to do that even without an ulnar deformity, I've had, uh, you know, say a proximal third forearm fracture that heals an extension, like 30 degrees of extension of the proximal third of the radius, and they either lose pronation or they have a secondary anterior radial head dislocation as a result of the, the kinematics of the PRUJ. So I've had to do that. Um, another question about the, um, the long-term outcomes of treated versus untreated uh, chronic montages. So that, that gets to the problem of, uh, so the long-term outcomes of treated ones are really quite good. The term treatment of the untreated ones is impossible to sort out because those that are doing poorly, we will see, but those who had it missed, creating a chronic montage lesion may not be presenting for follow-up later if they're doing well, and they, they wouldn't be brought back for follow-up because they were, their an injury was missed to begin with. And so it could be that for every one person that we have who's having problems with a chronic montage lesion, we have 10 people that are not having problems. And so I don't know that we will ever really be able to sort that out um, without screening radiographs of an entire population. So I, I, don't know that, uh, I don't know that that question can be answered. Uh, so if someone has full range of motion, no deformity and no problems, you can concert, certainly consider not doing anything. Um, and if it's if it requires something heroic like, you know, trying to reshape the radial head, for instance, I, I would say leave it out. Uh, okay. Can I, one more, please. Yeah, uh, Roger, uh, I have one question. Mm -hmm. In an isolated proximal, sorry, ulna shaft fracture, isolated ulna shaft fracture with the normal radio capital alignment, do you have a low threshold for uh, you know intramedullary fixation? No, I I have a low threshold for following them closely. So those yeah. are ones <laughs> where, um, you know, and, and this happened to me really early on in practice, and it was a real bummer. I had an yeah. isolated, minimally displaced on the shaft fracture. I looked at that radiocapitular joint. It was absolutely perfectly anatomic. I brought them back a week later, absolutely perfectly anatomic. I brought them back three or four weeks later, and it was dislocated. Yeah. Because I had a couple of cases where, you know, it was fine. But the yep. residents has done a plaster, which is quite poor also. I mean, I can't blame them also. And then a week or 10 days down the line, the radial head popped out. Yep. So and in hindsight, probably should we have a low threshold for this isolated ulna fractures? And that's one thing. Yeah, I don't think so. I think those we will remember really quite clearly. And and I I, I wouldn't blame the one that happened to me on, on a resident because I put the cast on and, and I mm -hmm. thought it was a good cast. So... Um, it's a, but the pull of the biceps, if there is, you know, an injury to the annual ligament, then the pull of the biceps over time is just going to lift up the radial head anteriorly. Um, I think that, you know, we see many, many 
minimally displaced or minimally angulated forearm shaft fractures. And the likelihood of this happening is very, very low. And it's, it's actually pretty straightforward to treat at four weeks. Um, you, that, that's a situation where you can actually still correct the fracture. You have to open it usually, but rather than doing an operative treatment acutely to try to prevent the maybe few percent that would go on to have that complicated. You know, if you allow it to, then you're going to save a whole lot of unnecessary surgery. The second one is, uh, any community on the right? Yeah. The, the length is unstable, do you feel like? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's just, that's just basic, um, you know, orthopedic principles. If you've got a, a fracture that's inherently unstable, let's say it's comminuted or it has a very long oblique component to it in the proximal third of the ulna, then I don't think you can, you can, you certainly can't use interventionally fixation pins, uh, tension bands not going to work because of the obliquity, then a plate is, is more than appropriate. And then there are different, different versions of plates. If you have um, you know, small, like 2.4 um, uh, LCDC plates, those are great. Um, or you can use one third tubular plates stacked one on top of the other that, it, that increases the strength dramatically. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dr. Jain, I can go ahead with you all, please. Okay. So, this is a three-year-old boy. Everyone can see the screen? Yeah, we can see. Hmm? Okay, great. So, he fell on his outstretched hand. Um, and two to three months um, later, they presented to me. They didn't, they were a little uh, cagey about the whole history. But there was a history of native bandage. Um, and usually, uh, patients who present to us, after having native treatment and not had a good result, usually they don't, they are not forthcoming with all the details. But it was clear that he had restriction of elbow flexion and rotation. And that was the initial x ray uh, that we obtained. Um, so one can clearly see that there is a deformity in the ulna. Uh, the fracture is a little bit more uh, distal. Uh, probably uh, middle and distal third, uh, and the radio capital line is clearly broken. Um, and that was him uh, showing only about 90 degrees of flexion. Um, and that was the main complaint that they came to us for, is the fact that he could not bend his elbow completely. Uh, he also had some restriction of pronation as well, in addition to this. Um, so, um, we uh, went ahead and did an ulnar osteotomy only. Uh, the radial head was reduced, closed. Um, so uh, I note from your presentation that you open the radio capital joint first, um, because in our, in our experience, we do the ulnar osteotomy uh, first, and then see if the deformity corrects and uh, if the radius sits in its anatomical place and then plus or minus or decide to open the radio capital joint. Um, any comments from Professor Conwell about this? Yeah, I think that's that's totally fine. It, you know, it depends a little bit on the, the how far out the radial head is. And by that, I mean, how, how far out is it? Is it in distance? Um, how likely is it that there's interposed soft tissue? And how far out is it in time? Meaning, has the the soft tissue sort of remodeled around the radial head? Because nature abhors a vacuum. So if it's out for you know two years, it's not there's not going to be a clear shot between the radius and the ulna at the PRUJ. So I think that um, that I think that's totally that's totally fine. It, you can you can do it in a stepwise fashion. I just tend to see these you know fairly far out, and we'll just go right at the the radius. And one of the things that I that I learned in, in a couple of cases where I did these uh, without opening the radial head initially is that you you do the ulna osteotomy and you, you feel that you're, you're pushing pretty hard to get the radius reduced and you're holding it in supination because then that takes the, the bend at the bicipital tuberosity and points it a little bit more towards the radius and you're pushing down a little bit when you get your fluoro and you're hyperflexing a little bit. All of those are like a crime scene. Those are signs of a struggle. And so if you find that you have to do any of those to get your radius reduced, just go ahead and open the 
the radio capitola joint and, and make it easy. So, so I, and, and after struggling a few times with that, I, I think it's, uh, it, it, I, I just would have a low threshold to open the, the radio capitola joint, but yeah, you can, you can certainly give it a shot without it. Okay. So have a, can do the ulnar osteotomy first and then have a low threshold for reduction of radio capitola joint and the radius should yep. sit very comfortably uh, yes. in the correct yes. place without any additional force. Yeah. So and, I think, and I, I also like to test it in extension and pronation, right? Which is the one position that's going to most likely, and so uh, this is for an anterior dislocation, of course. The, the one position that's most likely to re-dislocate is in pronation and extension. And so if it stays in pronation and extension, you're good. You're good. Um, and I think that answers the second question as well. When do we open the radial head? The third question is, when do we reconstruct the annular ligament? Because as you mentioned in your talk, annular ligament is a kind of double-edged sword. It gives you stability, but it takes away movement. So uh, do you have to reconstruct the annular ligament often? Because I have gone off doing annular ligament re reconstructions completely because of significant and severe stiffness, which turns out to be a bigger problem than having a dislocated radial head. I agree completely. I never do it anymore. Oh, really? Okay. So that's a very, that's a very good point because all the textbooks mention annular ligament reconstruction. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So that's off the it's off the menu now. Yeah, it's off my menu. Yeah. In fact, in fact, that is the one of the most difficult step for us. <laughs> well, to get rid of it, and you'll be happier. In fact, sometimes I don't even repair the annular ligament. So that the case that I showed you of the anteromedial dislocation, when I repaired the annular mm -hmm. ligament, it, it shortened the lateral side of the annular ligament, which pushed the radial head medially. So I had to take the sutures out to get it to reduce again. And so it's not something that, uh, so yeah, the soft tissue stability is not what you need. It's the bony architecture that's what you need there. And what is your surgical approach? And this is something that's never mentioned in post talks, how would you approach, uh, would you make a single incision that covers the radio capital joint and extending onto the ulna so that you can get everything done in a single incision? How do so, you do it? Uh, yeah, I, I did that once, once, <laughs> and not thereafter. So the Boyd approach, which will go under the ancneus and you can see the ulna beautifully, you can see the PREJ magnificently, you've got the radial head there and it, it's great until you get like complete ossification of the ankyneus and your annular ligament reconstruction and there's no motion at all. So, so I, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that approach. So I use two separate approaches, uh, just a, to wherever the ulna needs to be, just a, a midline posterior approach and then a, a lateral approach to the radius. And, and I, I don't pay too, too much attention to what interval I'm splitting the extensors there. Um, and, uh, and it matters a little bit where the radial head is and whether, you know, if it's a lateral dislocation or an anterior dislocation. Uh, one thing is I, I don't typically go and find the radial nerve and the PIN. Um, that, uh, that hasn't been a part of my approach. I know Don Bay in Boston always does. He starts up at the brachialis, brachioradialis interval, finds the radial nerve and traces it down because it sits directly on the capsule anteriorly and is the most likely nerve to be injured. Actually, the radial nerve proper, not just the PIN. Um, so uh, it's a, a very high anterior dislocation and you're finding it difficult to find the radial head because the neck kind of disappears out in front of the capsule, then it can be advisable to go and find the radial nerve proximally, trace it down just so you're not going to injure that. <clears throat> um, and I think the fifth question we've already answered about three years, I think is what you said, up to three years and so long as the radial head is concave uh, mm -hmm. and it will sit uh, comfortably in the radio capital articulation. And what complications should a surgeon warn the family about after uh, reconstruction? What are all the problems that you have faced uh, which we can expect? after this sort of surgery, because it's not easy surgery. Right. Yeah, so I think the, the biggest complication is residual instability. And I think that it, that's predominantly um, driven by, you know, the, the how you do the ulna osteotomy. And so I've had them re-dislocate, friends have had them re-dislocate, good colleagues of mine have had them re-dislocate. And I think you, you have to have a stepwise approach to how you're going to, to deal with that. I don't just pin all of them. Uh, and, and I certainly don't reconstruct the annular ligament, but I think it's something to, to keep in mind because there are 
downsides to pinning. You can break a pin in a joint. You can have all kinds of problems that way from the treatment itself. And so I will very often tell folks, I will do the ulnar osteotomy. I'll get it as stable as I possibly can. If it redislocates when it's trying to heal, I will go back and put a pin in, but I'm going to let the fracture and the, the situation tell me that that's absolutely necessary rather than try to guess that it would be necessary. Um, and so that's uh, that can be almost even a staged procedure rather than a complication, although that, that really is the biggest complication. Of course, when you're cutting an ulna, especially if you're going for distraction, I see you went for some, some length in this case um, without a bone graft and an, oh. an, acute, an acute lengthening. Um, that tends to be more often necessary when they're two, three years out from the surgery. And so that can lead to some troubles with the delayed union or, or uh, non-union of the ulna. So that can occur as well. You can cause a radial nerve or PIN injury while, while you're doing the approach. Um, you could potentially cause AVN of the radial head uh, or AVN of the capitellum with a, a, an aggressive approach. Um, and then stiffness is, is potentially an issue. But I'm, I, I have a sense that Montagia fractures tend to happen in ligamentously lax individuals. And so my experience has been that after these reconstructions, they get their range of motion back scary fast. Like two weeks after their cast is off, they're like, look, doc, I'm good. And you're like, ah, don't redislocate. You know, and you're sitting there nervously waiting for the x-rays to see if they've redislocated their, their radio capitular joint. So, so stiffness overall doesn't tend to be a, a really big problem. So this boy um, basically did pretty well. <clears throat> and you can see that I've done my osteotomy at a completely different level uh, to the original fracture. Uh, because I want it to be as close to the radio. Is that okay? Would you you you'd be okay with that? Exactly what I would do. Yes. Again, from a healing standpoint, you can see how beautifully that's healed without bone yeah. graft and, and with a, a big gap. So that's that's not going to happen in the shaft of the ulna, but that'll happen at the proximal end. Yeah. So and then he was due for implant removal, and this was COVID time. Uh, you can see that he's got his mask on <clears throat> on the previous clinical photo, he was due to come back for implant removal. And then unfortunately he fell again and fractured below his implant. So, and I just looked at the radial head and I was not very, very happy with that. Um, so um, I, I was just thinking compared to the previous X-ray, the radial head was coming out a little bit um, anteriorly and I was really scared. So I thought three options, remove the plate and cast him. Um, or extend the plane or do an IM nailing. Um, have you ever encountered such situations? <laughs> I'm not in not in a in a Montagia per se, but in in other forearm fractures. Yes, I've had fractures at the ends of plates, and and that can be a, a, a real difficult situation. I, I think in this circumstance, if you if you go back a slide, actually, I'd like to make a, a point about the radio capitular line. Um, you've drawn a radio capitular line along the entire. You've drawn a line along the entire radius, and uh -huh. uh, and the radius is not a straight bone in in any position at all. And so when we when we did the studies about the uh, the radio capitular line in normal elbows, we found that if you drew the line just on the neck of the radius, it had a better relationship uh, or a more consistent relationship on the lateral view with the cap. Capitellum, whereas if you draw the draw it all the way down the length of the radius towards the capitellum, and so so it's going to look a little bit off. But even even if you drew the line right along the neck of the radius, and then it was let's say in the anterior third or the proximal third of the capitellum, as it looks like it is here, you still can't say that that's a little bit off. The radio capitellar line is simply not able to resolve subtle difference in radio capitellar alignment, and so I honestly think this looks great. I, I think the radio capitular relationship looks anatomic. I, I would not okay. be concerned about that. So anyway, we uh, were a little nervous. So we went uh, went ahead and uh, removed the plate and uh, put an intermediary rod. Uh, and you can see on this one, I've actually overcorrected it because of my anxiety and pushed the, <laughs> the, the radial head a little bit more back by placing the the pin a little bit more anteriorly. So that was just my nervousness as a surgeon because I didn't want to ruin a perfectly good result. But the latest follow-up, I mean, is uh, still because of COVID, 
uh, we are not uh, able to maintain a, a regular service. Um, so uh, you can see that he's, he's healed up and it's all stable and um, they're, they're happy. So just to, this is just a long, long Montagia story. So I just thought I just put it up as a case. Um, I've got longer so stories with more complications than one patient. So don't, don't feel bad. So anyway, so that, that's, that's my Montagia story. Thank you. Yeah, thank cool. you, Dr. Sampar. It's a great case. Uh, we'll go with the next talk, Professor. We're out of time. Okay. Yeah, each of these topics we could talk about for hours. It's good fun. Um, so lateral condyles are next. Okay, so so you'll notice on the on the program that the title of this talk is uh, lateral condyle pediatric lateral condyle humeral fractures. Um, what could possibly go wrong? So speaking of uh, long stories and complications, this will certainly be focused on that. Again, I, I have no uh, disclosures. Uh, we'll talk about the injury, the evaluation, and treatment, but then spend a fair bit of time talking about the complications of lateral condyle fractures because this is one where. The, the injury and the treatment decision-making is really driven by what could possibly go wrong. So these are relatively common, 10 to 15% of pediatric elbow fractures, usually in the six to 10 year age range from a fall on an outstretched hand or foosh. I'm not sure, do you use that uh, in India? We use that all the time here, the foosh um, nomenclature. <coughs> yes, yes. Okay, yes. good. Yes. Okay, good. Um, and uh, with some degree of valgus stress, and it creates an intraarticular and transpicial fracture, as you know, which historically was classified by Milch based on the direction of the fracture line and how it, how it came through the, the trochlea as well. But that doesn't seem to be all that helpful, whereas the Jakob classification tends to be more helpful, where type 1 is non-displaced, type 2 is displaced a couple of millimeters, but with an intact cartilage hinge. And try as I might, I could not find anywhere a, a really good uh, example uh, or a really good drawing of that because here the drawing of type 2 has a non-intact cartilage in hinge and this is <laughs> not what the distal humerus looks like so that's actually really quite disappointing I need to call up uh, my buddy Dan and say hey you need to draw a good picture of the Occam classification but type 3 is displaced and, and the rotation is a really uh, important component of that displacement and I'll talk about that in, uh, towards the end um, evaluating these, of course, is, is important. Uh, the mechanism of injury is, is good to get a sense of, but also the uh, presence of any concomitant injuries because this is a little bit higher energy in certain circumstances than, than uh, say, a Montagia lesion might be. And so you have to think about what's happening at the shoulder and the wrist. Um, pay really close attention to the amount of swelling on the physical exam. So here's a good example where the capitellum looks kind of sort of in the right place. Maybe there's a little black here that the, the less experienced could call a a lateral epicondyle fracture. I've seen that even if it's going to be many years before the epicondyle ossifies, mm -hmm. uh, that could be misconstrued. But look at how much swelling there is. You know this is a big injury when you've got that much soft tissue swelling. So pay attention to that. Pay attention to the location, location of tenderness that can help differentiate it from a supracondylar fracture. Um, there usually isn't a lot of deformity. So if there is deformity, you know that it's pretty badly displaced. And the range of motion can be quite good if it's not uh, displaced, but it can be really quite impaired, especially in flexion and extension if it is displaced. Radiographs, of course, are necessary the standard AP and lateral, but an in, in internal rotation of weak film is very, very important here. And that could be really anything from a bad lateral to a bad AP, but just something with the elbow internally, the shoulder internally rotated will point out the fracture line the best. So without any movement of the fragment, you can see that there's more displacement visible here than there is on these other two views. Um, advanced imaging is sometimes necessary. MRI can show you an intact cartilage hinge if you're not sure really how it looks. It can also give you a sense of the displacement, but again, it can require anesthesia or sedation in young children. So again, if you think you're not going to have to operate, if you just really wanna rule out any articular displacement, then, or any articular extension of a fracture that might be a supracondylar but looks kind of low, maybe it's a lateral condyle, then an MRI can be helpful. But if you think that it is going to need something done, then take them to the OR and do an arthrogram, which can be used pre and post reduction, to, as shown here, to confirm uh, alignments of the, uh, the articular surface. So the differential includes a supracondylar humerus fracture where you'll have medial tenderness as well. And, and interestingly, even in these young children, you can usually detect an absence of medial tenderness in a lateral condyle fracture. 
And so that's something to keep in mind, especially if you have a what you think is an occult elbow fracture. So you have anterior fat pad elevation and tenderness and swelling, but there's no medial swelling. Those are ones that I will cast as, as you would with a, a suspected occult supracondylar fracture. But I'll actually get x-rays later just to make sure it's not just a lateral, not a lateral condyle fracture because three weeks in a cast may not be sufficient. Of course, the supracondylar will have a more transverse fracture line. You can have a radial head or neck fracture instead, but that's usually only confused when the radiographs are really, really subtle and can be differentiated by the location of tenderness and pain with forearm rotation. So again, as I mentioned, we, we think about, I, or at least I think about these things like all the different problems that can occur. So, because that can, um, uh, so that can, uh, I, I just got a notification to start my video, but it, oh, here we go, that video. Sorry about that. I'm not sure how that got turned off. Um, so the, um, and yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually turn that off. Creepy. So all the different problems that can occur are, uh, are ways to help guide the treatment. So of course, at the elbow joint, there's an articular cartilage step off, which could lead to arthrosis if it heals in that way. But more importantly, I think is the collinearity of the condyles. So if you imagine you have a door with two hinges on it, those two hinges need to have the same axis of rotation where the door is not going to open and close. The same thing is true at the elbow. You've got the radio capitellar hinge and you've got the ulnar humeral hinge. And if those two condyles are not lined up properly, you're not going to have normal uh, motion of the elbow. And I'll show you a couple of really good examples of that a little bit later. Um, there, because it crosses the physis, growth arrest can occur. Uh, and because of the, of the attachments of the lateral and collateral ligaments and the extensor muscles on that piece, there's very little stability uh, to that fragment inherently. And because it's an articular fracture, and, and however this happens, the fracture healing tends to be really quite slow. And so all of these problems are problems for longer, and it takes longer to heal uh, and, and to avoid these problems. So the goals of treatment are to achieve anatomic alignment, truly anatomic alignment, and then maintain stability until healing, which is not something that's always uh, all that straightforward to do. And so when we think about treatment, of course, we have to think about it in terms of the displacement. So uh, a cast can be used for non-displaced fractures, although I will use weekly radiographs out of the cast. About 10% of these will displace, and you can see that happening here. Uh, and so there are a couple of series to, uh, looking more into that, and, and the, the overall sense in the literature is that they're all going to displace within the first five days, and so an x-ray at a week should be sufficient. But I have definitely seen uh, late displacement, because again, remember these are slow healing fractures, and so they can be slow displacing fractures. And so I'll follow them for uh, two to three weeks with x-rays. And I will take the cast off to get the x-rays because the fracture fragment, the thurston holland fragment is very, very subtle. There's a little fracture resorption that could be confused as displacement because they tend to, to move apart when they displace. Uh, and that can be confused with fracture resorption. And so I think it's, it's important to take the cast off each week to, to get a really good x-ray. Um, and, uh, and then for displaced fractures, you have two steps. It's not just maintaining, uh, not just uh, getting, keeping them casted until they heal, but it's uh, getting the reduction and then maintaining the reduction or, or using fixation. And so getting the reduction can be done uh, first with a closed reduction, although again, it's an articular fracture. So if it's displaced, you know you have articular displacement and you can't see the articular surface on, on a regular x-ray. So I, I would suggest that an orthogram is actually required uh, if you're going to use a closed reduction to assess the articular surface. Um, don't just use the lateral cortex. I'll show you a couple of really good examples of how that can be a really bad idea to just use the lateral cortex or the, the alignment of the thurston holland fragment. So, um, uh, and, and I like to do my orthogram from a posterior approach in the electron fossa because if you miss, then you're, and you have your dye out here, your contrast out here, it's not going to obscure your articular surface down here. And on the AP, if you miss, it's going to be up here. So again, it's not going to... Uh, uh, obscure your articular surface. And so, but if you come in with a lateral approach and you miss and it's out here, you can still see just fine on an AP, but it's going to be right here on your lateral and you're not going to be able to see the articular surface here at all. So just in case you might miss and inject extra articularly, I like to do that from a posterior midline approach and it's super easy and super safe. So advantages of a closed reduction include, uh, really it's not an open approach. So it's, it's quick and easy but there are disadvantages. So you can't actually visualize the articular surface three-dimensionally. So if there's some rotational component, you that's much, much harder to sense on, a, on an arth arthrogram. 
you have a uh, much more limited ability to control and see the fragment. And here's a, an example of a screw put in missing the Thurston Holland fragment. It's a big fragment too. This was done with a closed reduction. The arthrogram looked good. The screw on the fluoro shots looked like it was in the right place, but it displaced afterwards because the screw had missed. And so, uh, so that's a that's something to be to watch out for. This is a, a good surgeon who did it, um, and so it's not it's not a, a, a lack of skill of you know fully trained pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Um, and uh, and then of course it's not advisable, although there are some series out there uh, where in, in the best of hands a closed reduction can be used for a severely displaced fracture. Fracture, I do not advise it. So an open reduction is what I prefer for more uh, widely displaced fractures. So you can get good visualization of the articular surface. You can directly control the fragment and you can use it for, you know, no matter how displaced it is, you can always open it and get it reduced. Of course, there's the disadvantages of an open exposure. And if you, if you dissect or all the way around the back of the capitellum, you can get AVN of the capitellum. So that's, uh, that is certainly to be avoided. Um, and in comparing closed versus open reduction in those that are a little bit displaced, there, there are some data. So here's a retrospective study of two to five millimeter displacement, um, 51 ORAFs, 23 CRPPs. Of course, it was faster to the CRPP group, and there was one case of AVN in the ORAF, but, uh, or IF, but there were no differences ultimately in outcomes. And so I think you can, you can give a, a closed reduction a shot and only convert to open if you need to. Um, but then, uh, but then when you get to fixation, that's where the, I think the debate really becomes a little bit more heated. So there are proponents of pins using two or three smooth pins where there's the advantage of not having an open approach. Pins are temporary and you can take them out without needing surgery. However, you don't get any compression of the fracture sites. So you have a fracture that doesn't like to heal. So compression is going to be really helpful and you don't get that with the pins. There is a risk of infection from the percutaneous pins. And you might have to remove those pins either because they're infected or because they've been in just plain too long before the fracture is healed. And here you are in a situation now where you've gone to the operating room, you've gotten a reduction, you've pinned it, you've taken the pins out and it's still not healed. And you now have to achieve stability. So you end up going back to put a screw in. And so, uh, the, the, so that brings us to screw fixation, which is the alternative using one or two cannulated screws, usually in my hands, just one, uh, where you get compression at the fracture site. It can still be done with a percutaneous approach. You just need a knife for you know half a centimeter incision. Um, and you can leave the hardware in until the fracture is completely healed. You don't have to take it out for a risk of infection. Uh, the, the disadvantage is that you do need an operation to take it out. Although I put a question mark there because it's, it's unclear if you actually have to take these out. If the screw is in a Thurston Holland fragment, it actually doesn't even cross the physis. And so you could leave it in forever. And I saw someone who was in his early 20s who was going off to join the military who had had one of these screws put in at age 10 and he, uh, or, or even before 10. And he came in because he needed to have the hardware out. The military needed him to, to be have his hardware out. And the screw was all the way up in the middle of his bone up in here. It was completely encased in the, in the middle of the medullary canal. And I was like, I'm not going after that screw and it's never going to cause you any trouble. And so I don't know that you actually really need to remove those screws. Uh, but you also have to be prepared for weird looking x-ray because there's so much cartilage around even that first and Holland fragment that you end up looking like you just didn't do it right. Um, but that actually is, is providing excellent compression because of all the cartilage in there. Um, so, so how about comparing pins versus screws? There are some underpowered studies that, this, that say there are no differences, but you do actually have some differences in the literature. So here's a, a, a retrospective view, review of 43 pins and 41 screws. There were three non-units with the pins, none with the screws, and a faster return to range of motion and function when you used a screw. Similarly, a very well done study here, again, 20 pins, 22 screws, and this is from India, of course, uh, where the screws, again, had better range of motion, better carrying angle, meaning less redisplacement, and a faster recovery. So it's starting to look like screws are better. Um, but, but now here's a, a study of a uh, very recent study, a prospective study of pin fixation, where four of them had delayed uh, out of 32 had a delayed union requiring screw fixation, just like this case that I showed you earlier. And 9% of them had a pin tract infection. And these weren't all the same kids. So you have up to a 20% complication rate of pins. Yet these authors had, uh, you know, advocated for pins. So I am instead a much bigger fan of screw fixation. So for non-displaced fractures, again, I'll, I'll cast them. I'll put uh, weekly, uh, get weekly radiographs the first two to three weeks and I'll cast them until fracture healing where you have obvious bridging callus and it's non-tender. You can have callus, but if it's not bridging, it's, it doesn't count and they have to be non-tender. So that could be six weeks, it could be eight weeks, it could be longer. Um, I'll start checking for healing at four weeks though. 
Uh, for the minimally displaced ones with no or minimal articular translation, I'll use a percutaneous reduction and screw fixation with an arthrogram to prove it. And then uh, for displaced ones, I'll use an open reduction with screw fixation. Uh, but there are complications that can occur that you want to try to avoid in the treatment of these fractures, but you also need to know how to deal with. So again, slow or late healing, uh, or slow healing and late displacement. We know that we can we can fix them later, so we don't have to try to predict which ones are going to displace late, but we can certainly address it later. So here's a, again another good series from India with 21 late presenting fractures. I think they were fixed up to five weeks, um, where there were uh, there were still some good outcomes, but the outcomes were worse as the delay to surgery increased. So that's why I like to get the weekly radiograph rather than just let them go for six weeks, bring them back, and then get an X-ray, and if they're if they're displaced, fix them then. One of my partners likes to do that that way. Um, you can get redisplacement even after surgery, either from inadequate exposure or inadequate fixation. These are two different good pediatric orthopedic surgeons who both did the same thing, where the screw missed the fragment from a closed uh, reduction. Um, so again, if you're going to use a closed reduction, you know, make sure you know what, uh, you know, where you're putting your pin and, and your screw. And then you can get a non-union, either from a late presentation or from inadequate treatment, which is up to 1% to 2% of these fractures, usually the displaced ones to begin with. And in this cir circumstance, I think fixation with in, si in situ with bone grafting is, is really the standard of care. You don't have to get an, a normal reduction of the articular surface. And I think there is, in these kids in the age group where these fractures tend to happen, quite a bit of remodeling of the articular surface itself. And so you can get actually really astoundingly good motion, even with a non-union. They just have instability and they tend to drift into valgus over time. And so stopping that progression by fixing it inside you tends to work well. There are a number of different vascularized graft procedures that are out there that I haven't needed to use because, again, it's in an area where they tend to heal pretty well in the metaphysis of the humerus. Um, and so as long as you get compression with the screw, I think you're going to be good with normal bone graft. Um, you can use it. Uh, you can do a concomitant osteotomy if they have a really severe valgus deformity. And there are a number of small series that demonstrate good results of this. Um, a malunion can occur as well. And so here's a, here's a really good example of something that was actually diagnosed as a type two supercolor humerus fracture from these x-rays. And here you can see it healed with really nice alignment of the, that lateral, uh, lateral cortex here, but you almost have an AP of this part of the humerus and you have a nice lateral of the capitellum in the forearm. So there's an almost 90 degree internal rotation of the lateral condyle fragment. And so not surprisingly a block to motion there. And so here again, you, you, you can see when it's pinned that you've got really nice alignment of the lateral column there and how that can completely fool you. And so that one required an osteotomy, just like this one did. So here's another one that was pinned. Again, here's the trochlea out here in front of the, the coronoid, and here's the capitellum rotated 90 degrees. Again, nicely lined up lateral column. Um, but that one, of course, had a dislocation of the only humeral part of the joint and needed an osteotomy, intraarticular osteotomy, to get that to heal and to get any motion back. And so there is a uh, I've done a few of these, uh, uh, Peter Waters' group uh, and Andy Bauer wrote up has done a few of these as well, uh, but it's really hard to get good results. And for, in fact, the first one of these that I saw, but I think it's actually this patient that I'm putting up here. I was very early in practice and I, and I sent them up to, to or I, I asked Peter Waters where I did my training for Pete's hand surgery and like, how, um, how do you take care of these? And he said, well, you need to do an osteotomy. And I said, well, how do those go? And he said, well, I've done about half a dozen of these and and in, in half of them, I felt really pretty good. And the other half, I, I thought I'd rather stick a hot poker in my eye. So I'm thinking, oh, great, uh, you know, 50% hot poker in the eye rate. That's not too bad. I'll go ahead and give it a shot. So, um, so it's really not good to be, to be treating these at this stage. It's much, much better to get a good reduction the first time. Growth arrest, as I mentioned, can occur even up to 20% in some series. And I haven't seen this actually happen in my practice, which is why the rest of the slide is black. But um, but I'm sure it is something that uh, that can happen and can cause a fishtail deformity or other or other worse problems. And then there's this lateral prominence that tends to occur, and it's it's part of the healing process. It's cosmetic, but has no functional consequences, and it can happen even in non-displaced fractures. Um, there are a number of studies specifically looking at it with an incidence all over the map, uh, up to 100%. And so I basically just tell everybody that they're going to get a bump there, kind of like the callus that you see with a, a healing clavicle fracture. Uh, but that it doesn't cause any troubles. So uh, in summary, I think it's important not to underestimate this fracture, even though it looks very similar and it's a very close proximity to a supercolor humerus fracture. 
And it's important to explain all of these things to the family in the beginning, because as they start to happen, they're going to start to think, well, why is this happening to me? And it didn't happen to the kid next door who had the same broken arm and the same cast and might have had a supraconular fracture. So I think it's really important to, to put, these, put this fracture in proper perspective from the beginning. Make sure you have articular congruity and don't hesitate to use any advanced imaging or open reduction to achieve that. Um, and then make sure the fracture is fully healed before you let them go. And uh, of course, be aware of all the possible complications that can occur from the beginning so that you can help avoid them and know how to treat them. So thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Manohar. Yeah, I have a few questions. Yeah, uh, Professor Roger, I know you are not a proponent of pins, but we are still using pins only. <laughs> uh, one thing, I, have you done any uh, percutaneous pinning for uh, these kind of displaced fractures? So I did in the beginning. And, and again, my, my, uh, my learning over the years has, has been more poignant in my early practice than it was at any point in my training. Um, I, I alone was responsible for the creation of complications. Um, <laughs> the, the fidelity of the learning there is just so much greater. Um, so, so I think the, the circumstances that, that really got me to switch to using screws were the, that exact circumstance of you re get a re good reduction, you put the pins in, four weeks later, the pins are looking a little soupy, you want to take them out, there's a little bit of callus there, another two weeks later, they're in a cast, and then, and then you're, you keep casting them, and then you're at six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, it's not healed. It looks like it's starting to displace again. And then you're going back to put a screw in. And then you start talking to people who do that from the beginning and you start thinking, well, maybe that's a good idea to, to do the last treatment first. And, and it's just a lot easier to, um, to do it first than it is to do it later, uh, both from a technical standpoint, but also from a talking to the family standpoint. And so I, I've, I've had the problems with pins and, and it just seems to make sense if you think about it like a chess match where, you know, what are all the, uh, the, the, the moves that an opponent can, can have if you make this one move and do you have a good answer for that move, right? And, and if you can ward off all of those moves by making a different move first, you know, then, then it, it just it's smoother and, and makes more sense uh, in my opinion. So that's why I've, I've gone to using screws. And then the, I do actually believe the data support that. You know, if you interpret the data in a way that, that will confirm your hypothesis, you can get it to say whatever you want. But if you take a step back, I think the data do support uh, definite benefits of, of screws over screw the yeah. And second question is, uh, I've been reading a lot of papers uh, saying that prophylactic pinning for uh, minimally displaced mm. factors What's your opinion? Of course, we don't do it. <laughs> yeah, we don't get those cases out. <laughs> I think that's I think that's the worst of both worlds. So, yeah. not only are you doing something that it probably isn't going to do anything, right? So, if it's non-displaced, it's not going to hold the fracture. If it's uh, a slow healing fracture, it's not going to give you compression to put just pins in. Um, and if only ten percent of these that are truly non-displaced that you really believe are non-displaced are going to displace later, it's not going to really be justified to do 90% unnecessary surgery. And you can look at the, yes. you know, you can look at the, the clavicle literature and, you know, where in, in the adult randomized trials, you know, going back to the Canadian orthopedic trauma trial, where, you know, if you grossly oversimplify the results and say hundred percent of those who have surgery do well, and 50% <laughs> of those who don't have surgery do well. But if you then do the surgery on the 50% that don't do well, they all do well. Yeah, definitely. You can interpret that as like, well, it's 100 versus 50% success rate, so you operate on all of them. Or you can interpret that as only half of them need surgery, so why don't you let the fracture tell you whether it needs surgery or not before you make that decision? And so in this circumstance, it's 10%. So yeah, I don't think it makes sense to, to do an operation on 100% of folks when only 10% of them need it, and then do the one operation that, in my opinion, gives you the least bang for the buck. And what is your threshold for displacement? Is it two millimeters or? Yeah, so. Or it's progressive displacement. Yeah, so yeah, so I think you nailed it there. Progressive displacement or any translation are, yeah. are absolutes. So if it's moving or if it's translated, then, it, you know, and you think about the, the anatomy of the fracture. So if it's translated, we know that there's incongruity at the articular surface because it can't translate with an intact cartilage hinge. 
And then if it's, uh, if it's oblique, then just the longitudinal pressure of having muscles crossing the elbow joint, even in a cast, is going to shear that fracture into further displacement. So that's an inherently unstable situ situation like a Bowler Barton's fracture in an adult distal radius, for instance. So I think that uh, any translation and, uh, and any progressive displacement are indications. As far as the amount of gap that you see, I think that's, uh, that's a little bit debatable, of two millimeters maybe of a hinge, um, but it's, uh, that's, that's where it gets a little bit trickier, I think. So in these tricky instances, do you take the help of further imaging? Yeah, so sometimes what I'll do is, uh, if I'm not quite clear, but I'm betting that they don't need surgery, I'll use an MRI to prove that they don't need surgery. Um, if I'm betting that they probably do, then I'll, I'll take them to the OR and do an arthrogram. arthrogram. But even, even when you have that hinge, I think you, you still can have a normal looking arthrogram. But it's, uh, but it, so if I'm, if I'm really on the fence, I, and I'm erring on the side of, not doing surgery, then I'll, I'll use an MRI just to prove the articular surface looks really good. But I do have a low threshold for fixing these, again, because I, I use a screw and, and <laughs> for the compression, not just for the fixation and stability, but for the actual compression of the fracture. And I think that actually speeds up healing. It doesn't just hold it until it heals. I think it actually improves healing. So think about scaphoid non-unions. You're not going to get as quick healing unless you actually compress the fracture. So that, I think there's a there's a real benefit to that from from the screw. Yeah, and since you're using only one screw, so when thing. would you do this minimally invasive uh, uh, screw, and when would you actually uh, extend the incision and have a look into the articular surface? Uh, because you mentioned that you would do a small incision and uh, just place a screw for the displaced ones. Yeah, so for the, if it's displaced as a hinge, and I get an arthrogram that shows that there's an intact cartilage hinge or that there's good alignment of the articular surface, then I will, I will put the K-wire in just like you would when you pin it, but then just put a screw over it. And then, uh, and then that will compress that, uh, that fracture and, and help with the healing. If it's translated or if it's rotated, then I'll open it for sure. You'll open it. Yep. Yeah. See, for a completely displaced fracture, you're going to put only one screw. How long are you going to immobilize in a cast after that? We are all worried about one screw, you know, it's undisp completely displaced, unstable fracture where that will give any rotary instability. Right. So I think that's a, that's an important point. The, the subtleties of the screw fixation, I think, are important as well. So if you're going to use one screw, and I typically do use one screw because you've got one piece of real estate in the, the metaphyseal portion of that fragment to get a good screw in the middle of it, just where that Thurston Holland fragment is. Um, with a washer to reinforce it typically. Um, but you need to get compression. You can't just put a screw in uh, up, the, up the middle of the lateral column. It's intermedullary. You're not going to get good fixation. But if you think about the, the three-dimensional anatomy of the lateral column, as it pinches together in the electronon fossa, you have the electronon and coronoid fossa come together. You've got a little notch there or, or a crotch, if you will, of, of anterior and posterior cortical bone. And if you put the screw up in there, you get very very solid purchase in that V as you put the screw up into that V. In fact, such solid purchase that I've actually stripped all of the threads off the shaft of the screw, turning the screw through there. It, um, that's happened in a couple of times with the Synthes screw. It's really pretty dramatic. It looks like a curly fry or a pigtail sitting in the middle of the bone. It's, it's really pretty distressing. But, um, but that you can get very good a bite and then get good fix. Not uh, suggest going all the way to the cortex to get fixation because for the cortex, then you're going to end up wrapping all that stuff up and that can be a problem. So, so, I, so if you're going to use one screw, make sure you have compression. And then when they have compression, that actually provides a tremendous amount of rotational stability because now you've got interdigitation of, of trabeculae, et cetera. Uh, but you can use two. You saw two screws in that non-union cir circumstance there where the puzzle pieces don't fit well together. And so then you, you, you need a little bit more stability. So, so putting two screws in is definitely possible. We have an audience question. Uh, one of them is asking, how do you take an interlocution view of the lateral corner? <laughs> That's a great question. So um, what, what I like to do, uh, or what I started doing, is get four views of the elbow. Get 
AP, lateral, and two obliques, because one of those two obliques is going to be the right one. <laughs> and <laughs> in this way or this, way, you're going to get it at some point. Or you, you just ask for an AP and lateral, and sometimes the lateral is so bad that it's an internal rotation oblique, yeah. and that's just, just fine. But, um, but y- you have to specify that it's an internal rotation oblique. And I don't think the actual number of degrees matters that much. And so if, if your elbow is at 90 degrees, let's say, because they're in a splint uh, or they just can't extend and the beam is coming straight down, just internally rotate the shoulder a certain amount and you're going to get the, the right view. It can be an almost AP. It can be an almost lateral. It just has to be somewhere in that range. Um, if you're not sure that you can work with your radiographer well enough to sort out that this is what you mean by internal rotation then, and not its internal rotation of the beam, which is external rotation of the shoulder, then then get two obliques and one of them will be right. So, Dr. Do you understand radiographers very well throughout the world? <clears throat> They're all the same. <laughs> but you can work with, if you work consistently with them, you can, you can, Go over there. You can show them. You can show them the films. You can show them what you're talking about, and, and get to know them. and And then it can be. Uh, then it saves a little bit of radiation. Doctor Manohar, you want to present your case? Or yeah, yeah. I'll start? just go through a short case. Yeah, one case, please. Yeah. Yeah. This. Uh, yeah, I'll be presenting one case. So let me go through this. Yeah, we can see your slide. You can move your slide, uh, Dr. Manoj. So it's not moving. It's not moving. Just click on the slide and then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. here it goes. So here is a three year old boy. He slipped and fell on an outstretched hand. We still call it as a fush. <laughs> this was an immediate x ray. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Ro- Professor Roger, uh, do you want to comment anything about the X-ray? Yeah, so this uh, there's definitely a lateral condyle component that's rotated and, and displaced, but the medial condyle uh, is off as well. And so this would be uh, more likely a, a, a PDAT version of a T-condylar fracture. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so you're still, we are <laughs> expert. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, our surgeons thought it is supracondylar fracture. So Ooh. that's how, you know, they did a close reduction and uh, put it in a spinning. So, you know, what's your opinion at this stage? Um, uh, so I, I think if, so if they show up at this point um, and the x-rays look perfect, meaning everything looks perfectly lined up, I would still take them to the operating room and do an arthrogram. Do an arthrogram. Yes, <laughs> that's our yeah, opinion too. Yeah, if the, R, if the x-rays don't look perfect, I would take them to the operating room and I would redo everything. Yeah, but the surgeon thought everything is fine. Of course. So this is after three weeks. So mm-hmm. the as usual, the medial side is healing, the lateral side is not healing, but the surgeon thought still it is supracondylar only. And then he went ahead and removed the vice. So what so, is the message you could have given at this stage? So, the audience. so now looking at this film, I, I wonder, so on the, so on the, on the, the AP, well, they're both kind of APs, yeah. which is concerning. Um, <laughs> the one is internal yeah. oblique, <laughs> as you said, lateral internal oblique, most of the forward, times. But not really a the elbow. <laughs> yeah. That's, the That's very concerning. Um, but it, on the, the, the one looks like an AP. So uh, just on the lateral side of the more lateral of the two K wires, that bone fragment looks to me like the Thurston Holland fragment of lateral condyle, yeah. which suggests to me that the lateral condyle itself is mm-hmm. rotated about an A to mm-hmm. the axis by about 90 degrees. And yeah. so I think you're right. It is way absolutely off. 90 degrees rotated. Yeah. Yeah. So this is oh, two, two months later. Yeah. I'm sorry, these images were not very, uh, you know, proper ones, but then still you can make out 
how badly it is the rotated fragment. Right. Well, this I, stage, yeah, I would say you can't get good x-rays when you have that much rotation because the way you do your x-rays is you position the forearm yeah. to get the x-ray and the forearm is not normal relative to the elbow. And so oh, you yes. get a good view of the distal humerus by positioning the forearm on the plate. You've got a perfect AP and a perfect lateral of the forearm, but you've got two wonky views of the humerus. That's because the fracture is out of place. Yeah. So, so at this stage, the child is having the pain and stiffness. This one. So yeah. at this stage, child is having uh, stiffness and pain. So, you know, it's very obvious. I, we told the parents that uh, the child uh, not united and it is gone into it was rotated it was not you know, well aligned and uh, that's the reason it got did not unite so i went ahead and this was the intraoperative image as you could see this is 90 degrees rotated mm -hmm. so then i had to push it back into its position unfortunately i am still the pin surgeon <laughs> i want it migrated to the screws so this is the you know too many pins Pardon me. <laughs> so I wait about as much as the screw. Yeah. So uh, any comments now? Because you know by now itself the looks like uh, the lateral pandal is quite big. Yeah. But it is anatomically reduced, and we could access the giant and all. It was fine. Yeah. And so I, one of the one of the differences there, I, I probably would have, and this this would just maybe you know health system related, but I would have uh, probably done an MRI pre-op mm. just to better understand the anatomy. No. The fracture as well as the anatomy on the medial side because again with a medial condyle fracture i can't be entirely assured that that medial side is anatomically aligned and so um, if you're just building a lateral condyle around an intact medial column i think it's one thing but if you've got both of them involved, no i actually we had done the mri also the medial okay. side is very well aligned unfortunately i don't have the images to present here we had okay. done the mri it was well aligned it was only the problem on the lateral side but the only issue is the growth. The, you know, the radiographer has uh, already said, you know, there might be issues with the lateral condyle growth in the future, Absolutely. the physis. Absolutely. Yeah, you're doing an osteotomy through the physis mm -hmm. there, and that's and that's really disconcerting. And that, you know, I, I showed a, a couple of cases of these that have that have done with an osteotomy where it did actually heal and remodel mm -hmm. beautifully with dislocation of the only humeral joint. Um, and uh, and you typically do get a growth rest when you do an osteotomy across the physis and then rotate it around. Um, so I, I think that's that's almost a given in this circumstance. Um, and so something to something to watch for. You've got a little bit of varus here or yeah. rectus, if anything, and that's just because of the enlargement of the piece and how everything. Is, I mean, it's it's put together as well as you can possibly do, and um, but it uh, that might sort of auto correct a little bit if the lateral side stops growing and the medial side continues to grow mm -hmm. and you could even then start up with the seadesis at that point um, once it's corrected enough because you don't get a ton of longitudinal growth from the distal end of the humerus no. just to prevent so, a really bad valgus deformity so we have removed the wires so far is doing well hopefully you should not develop any growth arrest or fishtail deformity so that's the thing another quickly i'll just go to another next case he's a 12 year old boy he had an accident and uh, accidental fall again fallen out stretched land two years ago two years before he came to me he had the injury and he was conservatively managed so this is the kind of x-ray he came with to me and this is how we look like mm -hmm. so what do you think do we need do you need to any offer anything because he has got symptom symptoms like his you know his grip is not that great and he can make out he can't carry the weights and also on the hand Instability is there, though range of motion is good. Yeah, what's his um, what's his range of motion? Oh, he's good, pretty good. Yeah, so that's what really surprised me in these circumstances. You can have actually really good range of motion despite a ridiculous looking X-ray, and so in that circumstance, the the you know anything you do at the articular level is going to potentially make that worse. And I don't know that you can make it good enough to prevent arthritis down the road from, from this type of articular deformity. And so if the motion is good, I would consider fixing this in situ at the, at the articular surface level. And, and he's old enough that growth arrest is, is basically occurred and is inconsequential, really. Um, and, uh, you know, with a bone graft, and then depending on how much valgus deformity you have and how 
badly that bothers him, you could consider an osteotomy either at the same time or staged uh, proximal to the uh, to the fracture line to correct the cubitus valgus. Now, in these cases, do you think the range of motion is also partly coming at the non-union site? No, I think it's actually coming from the joint mostly, and and you can assess that intraoperatively. You can mm. say, you know, you can you can either do an arthrogram if you want, or you can just do live fluoro, and you can see if the motion is coming from the distal humerus or if it's coming from the elbow joint. Um, in the ones that I've, the non-unions I've taken care of, it's coming, the motion is really good and it's coming from the joint itself. I think there's a tremendous amount of remodeling. And in fact, if you did an MRI here, I think you would see a much better looking cartilaginous end of the distal humerus than that x-ray would lead you to believe. So, I mean, so what, uh, I mean, as you said, we didn't push it too hard, you know, we just do, you know, a minimal opening and then put a graft over there again, you know, as, I'm still a fan of uh, KYS. So, but then intraop, our you know aim was to still maintain the full range of motion. You know, I didn't want to push it down all the way to correct the deformity. Still maintaining a little bit of valgus, and then we put a graft and fixed. Any comments, uh, Professor Roger? Yeah, I think that's good. I think you, you know intraoperatively you're going to see what the motion is. You're not going to yeah. put it in a position that's going to compromise the motion. Um, and then, you know, fill it up with graft. I, again, I'm a fan of compression for healing purposes, not just for stability of the fracture, you know, but if you have enough divergence or, or um, you know, splay of the pins and you compress it as you're putting them in, you can potentially get a little bit of compression. So, you know, I think there are, there are definitely some, um, you know, there, there are more, there's more than one way to skin the cat, as we say. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so, I mean, you still add a little bit of valgus, but then still, okay, I mean, uh, our aim was to maintain the motion. That was an uh, important thing for us and also a bit of stability and union. So we went on to do well. I am then, well. So this is at six weeks and then six months and then uh, so it's one and a half year and then we have removed the vice and all. Mm -hmm. and surprisingly, his movements are good and uh, he's gone back to it. Now, I can't promise the same thing in all patients, but then yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, have you done uh, any kind of, uh, you know, same time osteotomy also? No, I haven't. Um, typically, the the cubitus valgus has not been, I've done cubitus varus correcting osteotomies, mm -hmm. but the valgus is not as unsightly and it mm -hmm. kind of hides that lateral bump quite nicely. So I've not had a circumstance where I felt the need to do a uh, an osteotomy at the same time or even subsequently. Good. That's beautiful. Thank you. I'll, I'll send my next one to you. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Mamuna, can you go on to the next talk? Sure. And no, so, yeah. sure, um, sure, sure, sure. Okay, so for um, for the next one. Um, I am going to continue the, the theme. Um, I'm going to continue the theme of talking about bad stuff uh, and talk about complications. Um, okay, my video did not stop this time, so I think we're good. Uh, and uh, and and this this talk is you know it gets a, a little bit out of the elbow, but it stays in the upper extremity. But I, I think it's it's important to think about things from a, uh, a sort of general perspective because you'll likely see all kinds of injuries throughout the upper extremity and some of them might seem like not such a big deal but then they can have uh, really bad problems associated with them so seeing some of those problems i think could be helpful um, so uh, back when i was starting my practice jack flynn i, I started in Philly actually at, at, uh, at in philadelphia at the children's hospital of philadelphia working with jack flynn and he, uh, he was writing this book with Dave Skaggs called Staying Out of Trouble in Pediatric Orthopedics, but he really wanted to call it Getting In and Out of Trouble in Pediatric Orthopedics, but the publisher didn't want to publish a book about getting into trouble because, you know, that you don't want to do that, right? You, you want to talk about staying out of trouble, but sometimes you just are going to get into trouble, right? It's just inevitable. And and I this, this picture really bothered me for a long, long time until I figured out it was actually Photoshopped. Because the the shadow of the the paratrooper here is much too clear compared to this shadow, so this didn't actually happen. But I was thinking, 
man, this is a really, this is a really bad problem to get into. Um, and, and sometimes we're going to make mistakes and, and those mistakes are often the result of poor planning. And so if we think about, uh, if we think about how to avoid those mistakes by thinking about our treatment, again, as I said, as a chess match, I think we can really, we can, we can make smarter decisions. So a, a treatment might seem like a good idea at the time, and you might be able to get away with it most of the time. But if you think about the, the options that your opponent, the, the fracture or, or, or whatever uh, injury you're trying to deal with, uh, if you think about the options that your, your treatment will give your opponent, if you don't have an answer for each of those options, then you're going to be in checkmate. And that's, that's why computers, which can think about all of the different probabilities, all the different possible outcomes of a given chess move are pretty good at playing chess mm -hmm. because they can think all the way through to the end game and, and obtain million different scenarios. Uh, so, so I do think we need to think a couple of steps ahead. And so what I'd like to do today is talk about what our opponent can do. Uh, what are some of the complications that can occur that can hurt us? And, and then how do we go from there? And so I'm going to change things up a bit and only talk about cases, only cases with complications. And they're my complications or my friend's complications. These are, these are good people where things go badly. Uh, and, uh, and that's not something we do enough of. But we need to be able to learn from our troubles. And so you can learn from your own troubles just fine. And I'm sure you do, as I have mine. But I would rather you have the opportunity to learn from my troubles, too, because then we get more learning done. So, so let's start with this. And, and this, this is a talk that just keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, it's slowed down. It's growing as my complications have decreased over time. But, but I think, the, uh, I think the, the point is we could go on forever talking about these different complications. And so I'll, I'll just go through a few of them and then, then we, can, we can stop. And I usually do this by asking people questions and I will not do that just for the sake of time. And it's a little bit difficult on, on Zoom as well. But here you have a four-year-old boy whose fingers were crushed by a rock. He was playing out in the backyard, and you can see he's got a non-displaced phalangeal neck fracture in his middle finger, but he's got this displaced phalangeal neck fracture in the index finger with all of these sagittal and coronal splits in the phalanx as well. So um, to avoid any further soft tissue injury, did a close reduction in pinning, which is typically what we'll do for a phalangeal neck fracture anyway. And we've got one pin going across to stabilize those sagittal splits in the physis. Um, he was put in a cast four weeks later. Here's what his x-rays look like. Didn't look fully healed. This one pin was a little bit loose. We took it out, put him back in a cast. Comes back at six weeks. Things are reasonably well lined up. It looks like there's some bridging callus, but we brought him back a couple weeks later and he's clearly not looking so good. And at five months, he's obviously got a non-union. And so at this point, we're, you know, overall, he looks reasonably well lined up and he's got some motion, but he's clearly got a painful non-union through, through this fracture. And that's certainly something that can happen. And so took him back to the OR, didn't really do much of a reduction um, because he was well lined up uh, clinically, but packed it full of distal raised bone graft and then pinned it again. You can't really compression plate this and there isn't a screw for this fracture, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, and five weeks later, he was healed. He was solidly healed. And I was super excited. I pulled the pins out, got him started in a range of motion. He came back mal-rotated. So now he's healed, but he's mal-rotated. And we have to think, well, okay, now what? Do we take down this fracture again or, you know, and, and risk AVN, risk non-union, risk all the problems that we just got out of to get it, to get it rotated uh, back into position? Or can we do something else? And so I did a more proximal osteotomy, staying as far away as possible from the old fracture site and in an area much like avoiding the Montagia, uh, the, the ulna fracture mid shaft and doing an osteotomy more proximally. That's what I did and got him rotated around really, really well and he healed, but with an, a 60 degree extensor lag, full passive motion of the PIP joint, but an extensor lag. So I took him back for an extensor tenolysis and got a, about 30 degrees of that back, but that's as far as I could get. And so, and this all happened over the course of about a year or two. And so what do we learn from this? Well, I think the most important thing to take home from this is that the mechanism of injury matters. So you'll see tons of phalangeal neck fractures, but the ones that happen from a crush injury are always worse. All of the complications that can happen in phalangeal neck fractures are worse with that mechanism of injury because of the degree of injury to the soft tissues around the bone that we don't think about on the x-rays. Fixation is difficult because of comminutions, so redisplacement can occur. There's slower bone healing because of the poor vascularity of the fragments, and there's a poor soft tissue envelope, which includes the tendons. And so you end up with poor tendon gliding. So I think it is really important to keep in mind the mechanism of injury in, in hand injuries and in other injuries as well. 
Here's another case, an 11-year-old who punched his brother fighting over a donut. Um, very worthy cause. I, I totally get it. Um, you know, donuts are, are worthy of, of some altercations, um, but this one got a little bit physical. And so he got this fracture and you can see that, uh, you know, these films look fine. He's got a little bit of a gap right there. And so he was seen by a partner of mine who put him in a splint thinking things look pretty well lined up. But knowing that things might not line up in the future. He got some x-rays six days later and still measuring. This is less than a millimeter. So he's thinking that overall things look pretty good. And so kept him in a splint and came, comes back at four weeks now, clearly dislocated at the PIP joint with displacement of the fracture and, and no healing. And so, so in that circumstance, well, how did that happen? Well, clearly he's off now. But if you actually go back to the injury films and ignore the fracture and just look at the articular surfaces, you can see that you've lost congruity or concentric circles of the PIP joint. And here in six days, again, same thing. You've got a circle here, you've got a circle here. They're not congruent as opposed to the super convenient comparison view that happened to be on the same film um, where you can see you've got concentric circles there. So one of the problems with this type of injury where you have intraarticular fractures at the at the interphalangeal or the MP joints is that we get hung up on measuring millimeters of displacement and not looking at the congruity of the of the joint. And so that would be a little bit like an ometagial lesion looking at the millimeters of displacement of an ulnar fracture and not examining the radiocapitellar joint. It's the same kind of problem. And so he ended up going. Uh, we we did an open approach. So he came to me, and this is actually my one of my first surgeries I did when I moved from Philadelphia to Cincinnati. And this is one of my partners in Cincinnati who sent me this on my first day in clinic, this patient shows up and it's the son of one of our nurse anesthetists who was like, okay, we've got this new guy who just showed up and he's going to take this problem and do a big operation and fix it. So the nurse anesthetist called the anesthesia docs that, the, that she knew at CHOP in Philadelphia to see if I was a good enough surgeon to operate on her son. They're like, no, no, no he's good. He's good. So, um, so I did a volar approach, moved the extensor tendons out of the way, took down the fracture, moved it proximally, put two screws in the metaphyseal fragment, pinned the joint uh, at first so that I wasn't fighting the instability of the PIP joint, got it reduced, got it healed. And then 14 months later, he's still growing and had full range of motion of his PIP joint. So that was a bit of a save, but you can see now we have concentric circles at the, at the PIP joint. So that's something to pay really close attention to. And... What we can also learn from this is to be aware of the zebra. You'll see lots of these volar plate avulsion fractures where there's con uh, concentric PIP joint, but every now and then you'll have these dorsal rim fractures as well, where the central slip inserts and that you need to pay more attention to. And then you've got these bigger Salter four fractures that are associated with uh, instability of the PIP joint. These are much more rare, but beware that, uh, that they can happen. Moving a little bit more proximally into the scaphoid here, we've got a non-display scaphoid fracture. And of course, you know, if you see a scaphoid fracture on an x-ray, it could be more displaced than you think on an x-ray. So CT scans are always a good idea to make sure it's non-displaced. And sure enough, it's non-displaced on the CT scan here and here. Everything looks totally perfect. So I put him in a cast and five weeks later, he comes back completely displaced. Like this is so not supposed to happen. You're supposed to put him in a cast and they're supposed to take forever to heal, but they're not supposed to displace. But here he is five weeks later. So now he needs to go to the OR. So we take him to the OR and he's five weeks out now. So the puzzle pieces don't fit. So we put him back together with an open approach and a screw and then just the radius bone graft and everything went great. Got good compression. Four weeks later, he comes in redisplaced and with the screw sticking out the proximal pole. So he's collapsed and the screw has, has poked out. So this is a scaphoid behaving badly. So at this point, I take him back to the operating room, take the screw out to go and revise him, and he's now solidly healed. So between the time of identifying the loss of fixation to getting him into the OR, which is just a couple of weeks, he managed to heal his fracture, and he had reasonably good carpal kinematics and did not have a dizzy deformity. And so um, I, I elected to leave him, and he recovered excellent motion and had, had a really good outcome as far as he was concerned, but I worry about long-term how this is going to fare. And I asked Scott Coase, and I actually presented this at a, uh, the, the original version of this talk was at a POSNA meeting where we, uh, PF Orthopedic Society of North America, where we, uh, where I proposed just doing a, a, a session only on complications with these types of cases and I had all kinds of uh, other people there, Don Bay and Bill Enriquez and, and Peter, uh, sorry, uh, Scott Cozen, we're all there talking about complications. It was packed. It was great. It's awesome. Um, but, uh, but I asked God, like, what would you do with this? And he said, I only do one answer to that. Stop taking x-rays of that wrist. So I stopped taking x-rays of that wrist. 
Uh, but what to learn from this is that adolescent scaphoids, even if they're kids, so to speak, they're really no better than adult scaphoid fractures. And Don Day has done a lot of work on this and, and published a paper a number of years ago showing that the fracture patterns in adolescent scaphoids are changing to a more adult pattern. And you have to be aware of a lot of these different problems that adult scaphoid fractures can give you. Um, here's a, a good one, a quick one, um, uh, pretty uh, pretty telling though. So a 12-year-old girl was diagnosed with a wrist sprain after, sprain after a push injury four weeks ago. Uh, she comes in she's still a little bit sore, but just wanted to, some follow-up. You know, she's been putting an ACE bandage on there, but you can see that there's some periosteal new bone formation along the radius there. So it wasn't just a wrist sprain. There was something else cooking there. So we thought, well, maybe she had a Salter 1 fracture that wasn't really diagnosed or treated. So let's, why don't you come back in a month or two and let's see how things are going. She comes back instead five months later with a clear growth the rest of her distal radius and an ulnar overgrowth with an MRI showing edema and a lunate consistent with ulnar carpal impaction. And she came back not because we told her to, but because it was hurting a lot. And so we ended up having to do an ulnar shortening osteotomy and epiphysiodesis. So what to learn from this is that even an occult distal radius spicule fracture can go on to a growth arrest if it's untreated. So I do think that that yeah, underscores the need to take the spicule tenderness around the distal radius seriously. And if you're not sure if there's a spicule injury, I think we're obliged to treat it as if there is, because this can happen. And this is not the only case that I've seen where this has happened. And then it's obviously better to catch a growth arrest before at least ulnar overgrowth. So you can do just an epiphysiodesis without having to shorten the ulna as well, because that makes it a much bigger operation, likely two operations because the plate can be irritating and need to be taken out later. Um, and then here's a, here's a fun one. This is an 11-year-old boy. This is the son of one of our uh, radiologists here. He has this fracture. It gets reduced nicely, puts in, you know, put into a cast. It heals really well. So here he has a one-year follow-up. Things look pretty awesome, except he has an unstable DRUJ, where if you supinate him, he's got clear dislocation of his DRUJ. And that this can be done manually. He can do it. Uh, on his own, every time he supinates, he uh, dislocates his DRUJ. And so he's very symptomatic and he's a drummer and he cannot drum uh, with this forearm. And so if you look actually carefully at this, the, the x-rays at a year out, you can see that he's got a residual extension deformity of his radius and it's moved more proximally than the original fracture was. And so the, the degree of remodeling that occurs is proportional to the distance from the physis. And so as the physis continues to grow, the, the cora or the apex of the deformity moves more proximally. And so at some point, the, the ability for it to remodel diminishes because it's now further from the physis, but the impact of the deformity increases because the, for a given angle, the longer the arms of the angle, the more displacement you have uh, you know, by the sign of the angle, et cetera, at the DRUJ. And so you end up with this distal radio ulnar joint instability of the so-called supination dissociation injury showing up a year or two or three years after the injury because of proximal migration of that cora. And so the circumstance here is one of a bone deformity. It's not a, uh, a ligament problem. And so just like you would do an ulnar osteotomy to correct the radiocapitellar alignment, a radial osteotomy to flex it will point the bones together properly at the DRUJ. So you don't have to do any ligament reconstructions or TFCC reconstructions, and that can resolve the, or it can return the, the radius to its normal apex dorsal bow in this location, and it can improve the stability so that now, even just when his cast comes off, doing that same maneuver, it cannot dislocate his DRUJ. And so that's what's called a supination dissociation injury, first described in 2007 in a series of three cases, I think two of whom had had prior soft tissue reconstructions that failed, went on to an osteotomy that, that was successful, and then uh, Kevin Little and our group wrote up a series of seven of these, including some of mine, uh, just recently in 2018, going over a lot of the principles and strategies. So that is something to be aware of and something to uh, something to look for and uh, and in and, and later follow-up. Because it, it will see you. It's just a question of, not, of whether or not you recognize it. And, uh, and I'm pleased to say that, uh, that this, this kiddo went on to go back to drumming and actually uh, is a drummer in our band. Uh, and you can read about his story in a, uh, in a, in a, on a website called Hear the Hope, here, H-E-A-R, thehope.org, which is a charity that raises money by uh, writing and recording songs with patients and families. So we were the ones who kicked it off and he was a drummer in that band. It's super, super happy. And his dad, the radiologist, was the bassist in the band. So they're a very musical family. And He's learning his death metal blast beats on the drums now so we can we can get get move into more metal. 
Um, and then I'll, I'll leave you with this one, which is a 17 year old who had a foosh injury, had these fractures that were reduced quite nicely. And he was put into a cast and he was watched as he was slowly not healing these fractures. But what was missed is the fact that he was dislocating his DRUJ while these fractures were slowly migrating and not healing. And so I took him to the OR for what was a CT proven non-union of both of these bones. But of course, just like that scapegoid, he had healed it by the time he got there. And so I had to do osteotomies. And so I got these osteotomies done, which realigned his DRUJ, got him back to full range of motion. Um, and then post-up day two, he had uncontrollable pain and swelling in his hand. We took off his splint. And he had fracture blisters around both incisions and compartment syndrome in his hand, not in his forearm. And these were fracture blisters from the steri strips that were put across the, the wound on both wounds. And you can see how close they come together. So that was basically putting a tight, almost circumferential, non-elastic bandage just in the form of steri strips around his wrist that led to venous outflow obstruction of the hand and a compartment syndrome. So... I would urge you from this case to learn that you need to be careful whenever you're changing the shape of the bones in the forearm, because there is a risk of severe swelling and, and compartment syndrome, either of the forearm or the hand. And that includes malunion corrections, lengthening of the forearm bones, rotational osteotomies, or even creation of the one bone forearm. Those are all at higher risk for compartment syndrome. And then please, please, please use longitudinal steri strips if you're going to put steri strips on the wound anywhere around the wrist or hand. Um, and, uh, and the fact that this can happen underscores the point that there's nothing so simple that it can't cause harm. And so it's um, uh, important to think about uh, things like that. And, and as I mentioned, we did this uh, series uh, in, initially in a, in a pause in a seminar or a pause in a symposium. And so I invited people to bring your own case. Uh, and so I sent eight emails out to 18, 118 people who were registered to, to attend the symposium. And I only got eight replies back. You know, I wanted them to send me their complications. Um, and only four of those were human replies. The others were automated out-of-office replies. And only one of them admitted a complication and sent a case in. And it was an 11-year-old girl, another foosh with trampoline, radial neck and proximal ulna fracture. Everything was reduced nicely, the percutaneously pinned. And uh, it looked like it was going on to a non-union of the radial neck. And so bone stimulator was attempted. And here at a year, there's decent inflection and extension, some loss of supination, but it's a clear non-union of the radial neck. And so we presented it in this case and, and like, what do you do now? No one could agree on anything to do. In fact, no one had a clue what to do because there's nothing in the literature on how to treat radial neck non-unions. Why? Because we have a severe publication bias or presentation bias. Nobody wants to discuss our complications. And so we all suffer in silence. We don't put out the bad stuff. And so we don't know what to do when the bad stuff happens. And so I think very, I feel very strongly that we need to have a more open discussion of complications and bad, out, bad outcomes so that we can learn. Because no matter how well we try to stack things up, it doesn't always go as planned. And often we are faced with surprises. So yes, we have two sets of twins and the fifth one as well. Um, that I will admit was a bit of a surprise. So thank you very much for your attention. It, it's really been fabulous to, to interact and I, I look forward to, to hearing uh, even more discussion after this. So thank you. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> we have a question from the audience regarding the Montagia. So uh, one of them was asking, can we use a distractor to lengthen the ulna to get the radial head back into its position? Sure. Yes, you can. And, and that's something that I, that I had mentioned just in passing on the slide. And I think it's uh, those are circumstances where the radius has been out for a very long time because unopposed to the capital and the radial neck will continue to grow. We see that in congenital dislocations as well. Um, and so if the radius is too long, you have to lengthen it. And, and an acute lengthening, there's a limit to how much you can safely achieve and how much you can get to heal with the gap there. Um, and so a distraction lengthening, I think, is, is certainly reasonable. Well, the radial head is convex and the patient has stiffness. Is it a crime to exercise the radial head? Uh, wow, that's a fabulous question. Um, so I don't think it's a crime uh, if there is impingement, if there's stiffness. And in an anterior dislocation, surprisingly, there's often a loss of extension of the elbow. And I think there has to, something, there's something to do with the the, the tension in the anterior capsule or the anterior uh, soft tissue structures because of tenting over this prominent radial head anteriorly, they'll get a loss of extension. 
or there's there's snapping there's snapping of the bicep tendon snapping of capsule snapping of something during rotation or extension of the elbow and so in that circumstance i think you can take it out for an unopposed posterior dislocation where it's it's, it's grow, overgrowing you can take that out as well the concern and the um, the op opponents of doing that um, and uh, are are folks who tend to see the adults later on who will see arthrosis in the lateral half of the trochlea where you've got valgus instability from a loss of that secondary structure on the on the lateral side um, and so i think you have to keep that in mind however if you have a circumstance with a painful dislocated unreconstructable radial capitellar dislocation you've already lost that lateral stabilizer. You don't have any inherent valgus stability from where the radial head is in its current position. So unless you're intending to put it back, I don't think you're losing really taking it out. And so then the question is, well, what about a radial head replacement? Well, the radial head replacement is only gonna work if you have normal PRUJ and radial capitular alignment and kinematics. And that's the whole problem, you don't have normal PREJ or radial capitular alignment and kinematics. And so a radial head replacement, I don't think is a, is a reasonable option there. You wouldn't put a dislocated total knee, you wouldn't treat a dislocated knee with a dislocated total knee replacement. Have you ever had to shorten the radius? Have you ever tried shortening the radius to try and make it fit? Because it's, it's never mentioned in the literature, but it seems like the obvious orthopedic thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think there, there is a, uh, the threshold for doing that is not just that it makes, you know, it, it certainly makes sense. So, you know, I showed you an ulnar shortening osteotomy for radius is too short. You wouldn't lengthen a radius in that circumstance because it's much easier to shorten a bone. However, you do have to correct the ulna because you have to correct the angle of the ulna. So if you're going to shorten the radius, you're going to add another osteotomy. You're going to add a bone. And so if it's a few millimeters, you have to shorten the radius. Well, you can accomplish that in the process of doing the osteotomy that you already have to do in your ulna just by lengthening it a little bit. So I think that's one of the reasons that the radius osteotomy is not, the radial shortening osteotomy is not considered all that much. However, I think you'll see more and more of that as people start to use this materialized system to, to quantify and model corrective osteotomies for the forearm bones, because yes, there's always a deformity in the radius. I would imagine there's a rotational deformity, there's a, a lengthening deformity, there's some angular deformity, because in these chronic situations, the bone's still growing, it's dynamic, it's remodeling, it's going to have some deformity. Whether or not that's relevant is not what some, is not something that the materialize or the computer models can tell you. And so I think if you can get a, a little bit of lengthening in the ulna at the same time as you're already cutting the ulna, and you don't need to shorten the radius, then you're fine. If you, if you really need to lengthen a lot of the ulna, then you either have to use distraction osteogenesis or add a second osteotomy of the radius to shorten it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manohar, you have anything to ask? <coughs> uh, no, not, thanks. It was a very nice discussion. We are very thankful to Professor Roger for sharing all the information, whatever he has. Very, very thankful, Dr. Roger. Dr. Budhi will do the moment of thanks. Yeah. I, I really, I'm sorry, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to, to interact. Uh, I've always been inspired by the the, the creativity, ingenuity, and the good outcomes that you, you guys are able to achieve in, a, in an environment where the, the raw material that you're working with in terms of the, the, the presentations of injuries can be really, really challenging. I, you know, we, we would, you know, you see things that, you know, that we, we would almost never see or we would never really have an approach for. So I, I'm, I'm always humbled by the, the good outcomes that you're able to achieve and that Lateral condyle, you know, non-union is a perfect example of that. I, I'm very, very impressed. So, so it's always it's always been fun to, to interact with my Indian colleagues, and and I, I look forward to many more such interactions in the future. Thank you, Professor Roger. Definitely, you showed us many moves and uh, counter moves, as your counterpart Roger Federer showed. Thank you very much for your excellent presentations and uh, discussions. We have learned a lot of things from you. We also thank uh, Dr. Jain Sampat for his uh, beautiful case presentations and uh, Dr. Manohar Babu for your excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, if there are any more questions, anybody would like to ask anything more?
So okay. I think we're going to Yes. So we can we can end this session now. Yeah. So thank you, Professor Raja. We'll be signing off now. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care. Have thank a good you. night. Thank you, Jayant. Thank you. Take care. Thank Bye. you so Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.